All right. So thanks, everyone, for coming to uh, this security panel. I'm, uh, I'm really interested in trying to kind of bridge the gap between uh, the technology that Bitcoin allows for everyday users to use and the everyday users. So um, I'm really grateful to have a really awesome expert panelist group here. And I guess to start off, we should just go down and you know, give a minute intro or so of your backgrounds and your interest. I guess I'll start. Um, so my name is Micah Winklespecht. I'm the CEO and founder of, of GEM, and we're based in Venice, California. Um, we've got a bunch of our team up here this week, so uh, it was very fortuitous that you guys were talking about Bitcoin security. Um, I was a developer for about 10 years, uh, working on a bunch of startups, and um, just basically fell in love with Bitcoin uh, and quit my work, started working on a hierarchical deterministic wallet library, just tried to get myself plugged into the community. And I realized how hard it was uh, as a developer to get up and running in Bitcoin. There's such a huge learning curve. And so a lot of ways, our, our company was trying to scratch our own itch um, by basically building out a platform that developers can very easily uh, build apps uh, using Bitcoin and blockchain. So we provide a, a full stack uh, wallet API and platform for developers. Hello, my name is Mike Belshi. I'm CEO of BitGo. Uh, we also do multi-sig security wallets and platform for Bitcoin. I got into this mess, I guess, about uh, two and a half years ago now. Um, started out doing the whole cold storage thing. Anyone here have cold storage? A few people, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and I had a laptop and had far too much money and too much value on it, and it was sitting underneath the couch in my living room. And that led me to say, hmm, maybe there's a better way. So I discovered this thing called P2SH. At the time, there were no wallets out there running multi-sig. Helped do a lot of open source contributions to blockchain.info and other open source apps. And eventually built a product called BitGo, which is you know, fairly big now, and uh, trying to help people uh, secure their Bitcoins. So whether it's through technology that's open source or whether through it's our products, really what we want to do is we want to see Bitcoin have no more breaches. We want to make sure that there's no more Mt. Goxes, and that's what we want to do. Hi, I'm William. I work at a company called Airbits. Uh, we make a wallet. It's a consumer wallet. It runs on your smartphone. And our goal as a company is basically, how can we take all this advanced security stuff and put it into an app where you don't have to be a security expert to use it and still be secure? So how can we take these advanced technologies like two-factor and make them utterly seamless where you don't even see them? yet the security level is still there. That's the kind of stuff that we think about as a company. So that's what I work on. I work on the core of the wallet. I do the actual Bitcoin back and forth type, you know, sending transactions. I also work on the Lib Bitcoin project, which is what Airbits is built on top of. Um, my name is Ryan Singer. I started thinking about Bitcoin security uh, with an aha moment very similar to Mike's. I had a laptop that had 100,000 of other people's coins on it. Um, including actually uh, some of Mike's friends. <laughs> and so that really got me thinking about it. Um, I've been starting uh, enterprise Bitcoin companies for the last three years. My newest one is called Domus Tower. We're building clearing and settlement solutions for Wall Street. And we use Bitcoin technology to do continuous real-time audit, which is a pretty cool use of the blockchain, I think. Uh, before this, I helped start a... Um, enterprise multi-sig company called CryptoCorp, which is still running. If you're building multi-sig apps, you can talk to them, or BitGo, or Gem, or Green Address. Um, and before that, an enterprise Bitcoin exchange, and before that, about 13 years in enterprise open source, starting at Sun Microsystems. Uh, hi, I'm Joseph Bonneau. Uh, I'm a technology fellow at uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm also a researcher down at Stanford. Um, so I'm uh, not here from industry. I've never started a Bitcoin company. Um, my involvement has uh, been more on the research side. So I've published a couple papers uh, on Bitcoin, proposed a couple of uh, Bitcoin-related protocols. I've also been involved in uh, teaching quite a bit. <clears throat> so at Princeton last year, we taught uh, the f one of the first, if not the first, uh, academic courses that was all focused on Bitcoin. It's been turned into a MOOC on Piazza that's running now. Um, <laughs> that uh, um, some of you may have, may have seen some lectures from. Um, we will be 
teaching, now that I'm at Stanford, we'll be teaching another course in the fall at Stanford. Um, <coughs> also just finished, uh, and is on my website now, uh, the long, hopefully definitive academic survey of all the, the academic kind of formal research about Bitcoin. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, I guess I'm, I'm happy to uh, provide maybe the academic or crypto uh, perspective on uh, what everybody from ministry has to say. Great. Um, well, thanks again for everyone for participating. Um, so I guess to start it off, um, and yeah, I guess I guess wanting to keep this more of a conversational type thing, so feel free to jump in if you ever have a point. Um, I might ask a few directed questions, but other than that. Um, so I guess uh, my opening thought to this, the whole idea of security and Bitcoin is that, you know, we've had this situation with data security for a really long time. Data has always needed to be secure, but it's always kind of been in situations where it's uh, large companies um, or specific instances, specific individuals that need to keep their data secure. But with cryptocurrencies, uh, everyday individuals are starting to need to secure their data um, in a lot more sufficient way and um, in, a, in a lot of different kinds of ways, having a lot of options to do that. So I guess, Joseph, um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of correlations do you see between your research in general crypto and what you know, cryptocurrency is bringing to the space and what kinds of changes do you see within security? Um. Interesting. I guess there's a couple of different ways I could go with that. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin is definitely, um, I think one of the most interesting things is that it's putting, uh, I mean, I've heard the term universal bug bounty, um, where, you know, if Bitcoin security fails, if people don't manage their, their uh, private keys properly, they kind of immediately suffer financial harm. Whereas PGP has been around for uh, 15, 20 years, people have tried to, to manage private keys. Often it goes wrong, but people don't realize it. Um, nothing immediately happens if you lose your PGP private key. There's probably just somebody reading your mail in a, you know, far away that you'll never hear about. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, it's definitely interesting. It's motivated uh, a lot of new thinking and, you know, a lot of new companies, obviously, around how to get people to, to manage a private key correctly. Um, but I also think it's, you know, the assumption that this is going to be a total world changer assumes that we're heading toward a future where every individual has bitcoins and manages their own bitcoins and their own private keys, which I definitely don't don't think is likely. I think kind of like with email security, most people don't want to actually manage their private key and they're willing to settle for a lower level of security with somebody else doing it for them. Mm -hmm. And there's you know a lot of models everywhere in between. Yeah. Um, so, do you any of you have anything to say? Yeah. Uh, I agree with everything you said, except that I also think that one of the most beautiful parts about Bitcoin is that it's actually popularizing the use of private keys for the first time. So, uh, you know, up until this point, I think, you know, when you look at PGP, it's super complicated. The, 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 the motivation to use it is just not high enough. And what Bitcoin is doing is it's actually motivating a whole new class of people to understand what public key, private key cryptography is for the first time. And, uh, and what it's going to do, I think, is going to really, like, uh, slowly but very surely replace this idea of having a symmetric secret that both me and a service provider has to have. You know, the password, the password is dead, right? It's, it's, going, it's had its life and now it's going to die. And we're going to start using uh, key-based solutions using public key, private key cryptography. So I had the, uh, the lucky fortune to start my career at Sun Microsystems when I was 15 years old. And one of the things we talked about then was that the password was dead. <laughs> it, was, um, it, it was a big talking point. It was in the context of our uh, Sunray computers. We each had this access badge that we would have that we would put in and it would authenticate us to the system. Um, I think the problem with passwords is we did a good job training people to use them. And now we try to tell people it's okay. You know, your devices are your passwords. Um, you know, if you have your watch and your phone, then you're okay. Or if you have your phone in your tablet or your phone in your computer, then you're okay. And people aren't believing us. 
You know, it doesn't feel secure unless they're typing in a secret. And that's actually really terrible. Well, I think the reality is that uh, humans are simply not capable of keeping secrets like key material. Um, even though we think we are, uh, I'd asked in this room how many of you have a virus on your computer at home or malware that you don't know is there. Anyone want to raise their hand? <laughs> right, I mean, we all think we're better than that, right? But the stats are clear. Like, malware, viruses, 30% home machines today. It's just, it's out there. Humans really aren't capable of dealing with, with, with their own keys. Where do you get those stats from? Tell you what, just do a Google on, on percentage of malware on home machines, and it'll come up as like the first or second article. Look for, yeah, look at it from, well, it's going to vary across the board, right? Um, but mobile devices are different from PCs. I should say Go ahead and should... ask like McAfee or whatever, okay? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's hold the audience. Hold on, questions. hold on the stat for a moment, right? But I think we can probably stipulate that there's an, a shockingly large volume of viruses and malware being written every year, and it's hitting your home machines, and it's very difficult for humans, you know, just, you know, non-techies to manage those keys. So it's going to continue to be problematic for us no matter what, and we need to look for systems that. Uh, it, crypto, you know, starting with public key crypto, it's great, right? I mean, that's a really strong mathematical um, piece. But then figuring out checks and balances and, you know, no single point of failure so that there's other ways to store it rather than just on your hard disk um, that's needed. And, you know, as Ryan points out, you know, passwords are going to continue to plague us for a very long time. Uh, I just want to speak to one point that you said at the very end where most people don't want to hold their own Bitcoin in the future. I actually think that some of the biggest losses so far that we've seen have actually been cases where people weren't holding their own Bitcoin, right? The Mt. Gox thing, for instance. So in the future, if Bitcoin does do what we think it's going to do and become very large, everybody is going to be holding at least some of their key, if not the whole thing, in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, we're, we're vulnerable to exactly what just happened. And the, the honeypots are just going to get bigger and bigger, and then we're really going to be in trouble. Well, it's like you said, you know, Bitcoin's the best bug bounty program in history. At Trade Hill, I was running a $100 million bug bounty. So um, I guess to <laughs> <laughs> start talking about potential solutions, uh, at least for now, for people, everyday people to use, um, to pose it in a way that allows for to talk about all the different kinds of technologies, maybe um, you all can speak to the how individuals would store uh, 0.2 bitcoins, 2 bitcoins, and then 20 bitcoins. And maybe the different kinds of technologies that you're aware of, or you maybe don't want to say that you use, but you know other people use. Anyone can take this, yeah. Well, fortunately, those numbers are actually all pretty low. Um, so that's the right. easy, so easy part. I guess for now, let's, let's start with like everyday people. Maybe um, you have some Bitcoin. Maybe you're earning Bitcoin, but you, you're constantly spending it. And okay. Well, everybody's got a different relative value of, of, of those, right? Um, but uh, I, I think it also starts with what types of risks are you trying to mitigate? And at, at those numbers, the risks that you're mitigating are, you know, loss and, and simple thefts at home. Um, I've been touting multi-sig for a long time. It's a little bit self-serving, and I'm sure that Micah would agree with me 100%. Multi-sig is like a, a very simple step you can take. Um, and basically what it does, it takes the single point of failure out of your keys, right? So you can make it so that in order to access your Bitcoins, you need to hit two devices or three devices or two people or three people, et cetera. Those things work. Um, I think if, even if you look at the traditional banking system, you know, ultimately there's technology that protects things, and they've got business relationships that protect things, and they've got users that protect things. Um, so we look at it as like multi-sig, protects you on, against multiple, a single failure on a single machine, multiple devices, et cetera. Then you go to multi-users, you go to multi-institutions, you go to multi-geographies, multi-jurisdictions. You can keep layering on kind of these, everything has to have at least two guys in, 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 in line in order to, to access your Bitcoin. Um, so I think that's how you do it. You take out all single points of failure. Um, and uh, depending on how much value you're trying to protect, uh, that can vary. 
Lastly, what you do kind of for the last small amount is the same thing that the banking industry does, which is you apply insurance on the small amount of it. So you take away the risk from stealing the honeypot by dividing it up, and actually multi-sig and the blockchain are fantastic for this. Um, and then what's left over, you can actually cover with, with insurance. It's very reasonable. Um, one extra point on that in terms of just an easy way if you've only got you know, 0.2 Bitcoin and you want to use multi-sig to protect you against failure of one device or another, there's this wonderful product that uh, Overstock.com is selling called Ledger X. Or, no, it's not Ledger X. It's called Ledger. And it's a, it's a hardware wallet that's only $40 that you can use as your transactional wallet really easily, that's hardware, and it integrates well into the green address multi-sig wallet. So the hardware wallet keeps your local key, and then the green address API will do your other signature. And it works very, very well. And it's free um, to use green address for this. And the, wa the hardware wallet's only $40. And if that happens, um, <clears throat> nobody's gonna get your Bitcoin because they've compromised your smartphone. The ledger guys are here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd kind of like to back off and kind of talk about what it is we are trying to do. You have a private key that controls your money. So there's two things that can happen to that private key. And this is the two things you have to basically defend against. One is the key can be lost, right? You have this great security model. You have this key. It's written in five different pieces scattered across the globe. And you lost, one the, you lost them and you can't get them back. And you've lost your money, right? So there's actually a case of too much security. It's actually, I've actually had friends lose more money due to not remembering their passwords or from getting where they put something so they cannot get to their money anymore, then I actually have had people lose money from loss. And then the other, of course, is loss, where someone breaks into your system, the hacker, the virus, whatever that is, and then takes your money from you. So you really have to prevent against both of those. And a solution for one often makes the other worse. So if I've got a very secure way of storing my keys that no one's going to get to, there's a risk that I won't be able to get to it. On the other hand, if I put my keys in a lot of different places where they're all spread around so that there's not a risk of a single point of losing my key, well, now there's multiple places for an attacker to hit. So really what it comes down to is how much are you willing to put up with in terms of a bad user experience to get more security, right? So if I have a hardware token, I have to pull that hardware token out, plug it into my PC every time I want to buy a coffee, that's not going to work very well. So when we do a security, that's why she was talking about different levels. We could just say, well, we'll apply the best security to everything, but then that's not practical. So the less security you have on your wallet, the easier it is to use, but then, you know, the less secure it is. Yeah, I mean, I would just do the quick follow-up and say, maybe this is an obvious point, but uh, I'll say it anyway. If I was actually advising somebody about 0.2 Bitcoin, I would say pick a reasonable uh, online exchange, authenticate with username and password, and that's the, that seems to me to be the most sensible way to get started with 0.2 Bitcoin, which is not that much for, probably for most people in this room, and if you lost it, the, the consequences aren't so bad. So if that's really all you're holding, I think... I would say don't worry about a private key. Uh, there's, there's actually one third attack vector there, which is that um, it's not just about the, the security of the key, it's also about the, uh, the authorization of a transaction. So, um, so you, if somebody can pretend to be you, then they can convince a service, a signing service or whatever to, also, to sign that transaction because they believe it's you. Um, and uh, so for instance, there's, uh, uh, I was just alerted to this this week, um, there's a, a hack that's going around right now. It's not very well publicized, but um, it's hit about five of the biggest Bitcoin, well, I shouldn't say. I don't know the names, so I'm not going to name them, but it's hit five big Bitcoin companies uh, just recently, and it has to do with um, uh, hackers basically breaking into Gmail accounts and then pretending to be that person and having somebody within the company authorize a Bitcoin payment out of the company. Um, and that has nothing to do with having access to the keys directly. It has everything to do with people and processes. And so that's a huge component of security that's often missed. It's not just technology. So watch out, by the way, and, and make sure uh, if you're working at a Bitcoin company to, to if you're going to log into your Gmail account or if you get prompted with a Gmail uh, website, make absolutely sure that that Gmail account is actually your Gmail account and it's not a, a phishing page because it's hit really, really uh, big companies. Um, so I guess in terms of, you know, this concept of hot storage and cold storage, um, and, you know, 
there's hardware wallets and then there's paper wallets and there's a lot of different options for for people to get into. Um, essentially, I as as a user, as someone that uses Bitcoin a lot and spends it a lot um, in terms of um, you know storing it potentially for a long period of time, I generally suggest people to you know print out a paper wallet or print out a couple copies and store them securely in different locations. Um, do you, and I guess, so in terms of longer term storage and cold storage, do we have, do you have any specific um, recommendations or, um, yeah. So I think that for your day-to-day -day storage, you're obviously not gonna do cold storage. You keep it in a hot wallet where you control the keys have it available on your phone so that when you go to these businesses, and everybody here should be going to businesses and actually spending their Bitcoin. This is how we're going to grow the economy, right? Like, who, who actually bought something with Bitcoin in the last week? It's not very good, right? The rest of you need to get on that. So, so you need to have a convenient wallet for that. Uh, for your cold storage, um, I believe that we will probably end up having some sort of a hardware device. People have used hardware devices to secure money for a long time. They've always used uh, bank vaults and things like that. You know, shotguns are another way to secure money. <laughs> um, so I think we'll have a hardware device and most people will be willing to do that for, for a large amount. You know. So I think it'll be, probably be some sort of a token that has a key on it that then reacts with your, your online wallet to then authorize that transaction. That plus maybe a security service or something. That way you have you know, some physical storage that nothing, you know, I mean, other than physically losing it, you know, that, that is your backup. So I do believe that will come, but I don't think those devices are necessarily ready just yet. So cold storage is a very viable thing today, but I'll answer your question by thinking about the future, which is money stored deep cold is not very useful. And I think you could kind of go back in time and think about the banking industry. You know, you're getting started back 1850, you're a gold miner or whatever, you got some gold, right? And you take it to this guy and he's a branch of Wells Fargo and he's got like a big vault and it looks pretty safe. And he assigns you cubby hole number 43 and you put your gold in number 43. And when you come back, you know, the next day with your ID, you know, he says, okay, you get number 43. So gold was not really fungible. It wasn't really usable as money per se. It was like vaulted storage. Now, how many of us have gold today that we're using for transactions? Not many, right? So I think cold storage is kind of a, a failure of all of us to not have built security that's good enough for online use. So, I mean, the security panel, the technology companies that are in existence right now need to figure out better solutions. Like, you know, you got a million bucks. You want to spend it. Why shouldn't you, why do you have to put it in cold storage? It's going to take you a week to get out. I mean, that's the same old banking industry that we've always had. So. Um, Anyway, cold storage, what's the viable solution? Uh, there's lots. Um, and I hope that in the not too distant future we have security that we don't have to deal with that anymore. Uh, I'm definitely going to echo uh, what Mike is saying. Um, I actually think cold storage is really a stopgap measure. Um, it, it, it has a life for the next year or two maybe, but I think uh, what you're going to see is actual, um, it's a combination of things, right? Defense is, you, you don't have a silver bullet in security, you have defense in depth and, and eliminating single points of failure. So one of those is multi-sig, right? And so you're starting to see a huge adoption rate in multi-sig across services, so that's going to help. Um, then you have, uh, basically you need to have a rules enforcement engine, which essentially uh, enforces you know, spending limits, velocity controls, multi-factor authentication, all the types of things that the banking system has been doing for 20 years. We need to bring that into Bitcoin. And then the third step is I think that it's, uh, I actually, I don't believe that, um, uh, the, I think hardware has a role to play, but I don't think it is in separate devices. I think what people really want is to be able to use the one device that they carry. Uh, and that is their mobile phone. And so there are, you know, there are basically secure chips that are going into all the mobile phones that are being created now. Um, and uh, you can actually uh, use those chips inside of people's existing mobile phones to uh, generate private keys and sign Bitcoin transactions all within a secured environment. So I think that's more likely. And then we're trying to do the same thing on the other side. So on the enterprise uh, security side, um, we're using a hardware solution as well. It's the same thing that the banking industry has been doing for the last 20 years. It's called a, a hardware security module. And, uh, you know, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Apple Pay, all of them use this technology, but the Bitcoin in industry overwhelmingly doesn't use it. And the reason for that is simply that these devices, they don't speak Bitcoin. Um, 
And so we've basically been working for the last eight months to solve that problem. So now we have uh, hardware security modules that, that will actually do Bitcoin transactions. And we're using them to secure all of our own private keys. Um, and we'd love to see other companies adopt that as well. Also, I'd just like to note, um, between the guys who are up here and the guys that are in the audience, I've already counted eight executives of wallet companies in the room. Um, on the hardware security side, get your biz dev guy to call Rivets. They're really writing great code to have these mobile phones directly interact with your service and have these secure private keys in them. So you can have a multi-sig relationship between a particular mobile phone, all the Samsung phones already work, a particular mobile phone and a signing service like BitGo or Gem. It's really, it's a beautiful thing. Well, I just wanted to bring one point. Something that you said earlier was how to identify that I am me, right? Uh, how do I convince someone that I am actually authorizing this spend? A hardware the reason that, that I think a hardware device plays a role in the future, some sort of token or something, is you're physically having that is a way of proving that you are you, right? You, you physically have it. That plus other things equals you know, some form of identity. I'm just curious, uh, since we're talking about multi-sig a lot, as expected, how, how many people in the audience have heard about threshold crypto for Bitcoin? <clears throat> yeah, so it's about half. Uh, I mean, that, that was a, a Princeton research project. We're still hoping to make it better. It's a real pain with uh, ECDSA for a bunch of technical reasons, but hopefully for, it is, uh, you, you can do it, and hopefully for some, some future systems that will, that will come out, and that actually makes a lot of this stuff uh, significantly, significantly better than multi-sig. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in the long term that'll, that'll help out too. Can you give a little intro of what that is? Uh, oh, sure. So, um, <clears throat> so threshold cryptography has been around for a long time. Um, the idea basically is that you can split one private key into pieces, into n pieces, and some arbitrary threshold. Uh, T of those pieces need to collaborate to produce a valid signature. If uh, T minus one uh, T minus one pieces of the key, you can't produce a signature. You can't learn the full private key. Um, so you basically get the effect of multi-sig, but multi-sig is enforced by the miners, by the blockchain, to see that you know T out of n separate signatures happened. Um, you know, uh, threshold crypto is purely algorithmic. So there's uh, it doesn't you know you can do it internally. It doesn't rely on having multi-sig addresses on the blockchain. Um, and there's a lot of other cool features you can do. You can kind of reshare the key without touching the blockchain and uh, a bunch of other stuff. But that's the basic idea. Um, OK. So let's uh, talk, I guess, a little bit about mobile wallets and mobile security. So um, maybe someone on the panel wants to give a little overview of what SPV is and just like the implications of that and how mobile wallets are. Maybe William's best for that. <laughs> All right. So SPV is a technology where, okay, so you don't want to have the entire blockchain on your phone because the entire blockchain is 30 gigabytes. That would be very large to put on a phone and to download, over, especially over a mobile network. They're very expensive too. Yeah, about 30 gigabytes. So. You don't want to have to have that. On the other hand, you don't want to have to trust a server, right? So if you're using the Mycelium wallet, for instance, all of your transactions go through a single server that Mycelium runs. All your spends, all your receives, the fact that you have money in your wallet, it's all, you know, I don't want to pick on them, but a lot of mobile wallets work this way. Um, so the question is, how can I know when I have Bitcoin in my wallet that I actually have Bitcoin from the Bitcoin network and not just because some server is telling me that that's the case? So instead of downloading the entire blockchain, you download just the headers of the block. Each block has like a 300 byte header. It's relatively small. You download all of those and you check the mining work. You can actually on your phone check that all the miners did in fact mine those headers. And then when someone says you have money, they will actually give you a path to a block saying this is the block in which the money is. You check the header, you check the signature, the, the, the Merkle path basically that proves that that transaction's there and you know Yes, in fact, I did receive money, and there's no way that they could have possibly lied because the miners have proved it to me. Um, this, tech, this technology will be coming to Airbits. We don't have it just yet. Um, we're working on that. That's one of the things that's next on my plate, actually. So <clears throat> I, I guess I could add, I mean, there's, there is a key limitation there. If you don't actually have the whole blockchain, but just the headers, you can tell that you had money at some point, uh, but there's no guarantee that you actually uh, um, I mean, there's no guarantee that transactions you see haven't been uh, redeemed. So that's, uh, that's what you lose by not having the whole blockchain. 
so basically, you can prove that you have money, that something has arrived to you, but somebody could omit O transaction and not tell you about it, and there's no way to know that they didn't tell you. So the solution to that would be maybe to check multiple servers or something like that. And then if any one of them mentions a, a transaction that the others didn't mention, then you might suspect that they might be withholding information. But again, there's no perfect defense without having the whole blockchain for that particular flaw. Um, so in, in terms of uh, mobile, it seems like there's, at least for now, there is a lot of trust in terms of servers and um, other nodes uh, holding the blockchain for you. Um, what, what sorts of improvements do any of you see to kind of mitigate that so users aren't dependent on, on these things too? So, I mean, I think there's actually a fairly straightforward path to mitigating the, those trust issues. I think you, um, like was just said, I mean, you can, you can download uh, things from multiple places and they sign them and presumably these services would have a reputation and if they ever signed something that wasn't true, you could publish it and their signature would be on it so you could say it wasn't true and you can sort of get the risk of uh, the servers that you're asking for information lying you down to an acceptable uh, place by just querying enough of them and hoping that they have they all have kind of a reputational incentive not to lie mm -hmm. I haven't seen any of that actually happening yet, but that's what should happen and is uh, you know if you think about it for five minutes It's pretty much the design space. I don't think is that big um, There's an interesting thing with mobile for people who hit the higher levels of paranoia um, <laughs> So at the low levels of paranoia, where you're really just asking, can I trust this vendor? Um, mobile is just like computers, right? But once you're getting up to the higher levels of paranoia, um, once you, you can get to the point relatively quickly where you realize that all of, these, all of these apps that you're installing on your phone are all coming from the same source. They're all coming from the app store for your phone. And that app store for your phone can deploy updates to those apps without asking you first. Which means it's not just the server you're trusting from the uh, app vendor, it's also the server you're trusting from Apple or the server you're, you're trusting from Google. And those people may coordinate with people you don't like. Those people have had issues with employee breaches. Um, when you're considering defense, consider that that's a major vulnerability too. And you can't protect against it very easily the way that you would on the computer. The way that you would on the computer is you you only use open source wallets and you only download the code from GitHub and at least you can see the diffs. Yeah, compiling your own wallet, definitely the ultimate way to go in terms of gold-plated security. Um, I, don't think, I don't think normal people are going to be doing that though. So you have to trust some software at some level. Um, for instance, if you have a web page that you're visiting and it's a web page that's doing all the crypto in the browser, right? So you actually have encrypted keys, you own your own keys and all this sort of stuff. Do you trust the JavaScript that they are serving to you not to back upload those same keys to the server, right? Every time you visit that page and unlock your keys, you're at risk of having a breach if they served you bad JavaScript. So that's one level, right? The web wallet is the worst possible way to do crypto because every single time you, I mean, the blockchain actually had a, a flaw not so long ago where they served up a bad ram, random number generator to all their users. So anybody who created a wallet that evening had predictable keys, and I think they lost 200 bitcoins in that whole fiasco, right? Because they served up some bad JavaScript. They got returned, right? Um, I, I do believe that some, the person who took them returned them. Yeah. So, so there's that. Then you have an app on your phone that came from an app store. So that's updated, and you have some control over the updates there. You can check release notes, make sure that it's an open source app. So there's another level of security, and then of course, then above that would be you know something you compiled yourself. Right, so, so that would be like a middle ground, would be a mobile wallet that came from an app store that's open source nevertheless. So uh, I'll just quickly say, I mean, that this is, I guess, uh, like fairly well known in the academic computer science community, but if some of the folks in the, this room have never heard this, there's this famous essay called, I believe the title is Reflections on Trusting Trust by Ken Thompson. Um, <laughs> I would definitely encourage you to go read it because uh, it's, it's real fun, but it gets into the issue of even if you compile source code yourself, uh, are you sure that the binary that you get is actually correct because the compiler uh, could have actually had a bug and even if you compile the compiler from source code, um, there could have been a bug in the original compiler that you used. So I mean that's something that uh, academics have been uh, wrestling with for 30 years. We still don't have uh, great answers. So it's 
not quite as simple as, as compile it yourself. Um, but I mean, that's, that's definitely a big upgrade over downloading stuff from, from app stores. Well, the other point there is that it's not unique to mobile at all. So we started out <clears throat> talking about mobile, and you know, then we got into JavaScript. I mean, a vendor shipping an auto-updated patch, C++, doesn't matter what you compiled it in. Uh, it's a bug. You build bad transactions, you can reveal your keys. So um, JavaScript's not unique in that way. Uh, the browser is a treacherous environment for a number of reasons, but not because of just straight up bugs, as with the blockchain.info case. Um, but I think, I think on the mobile side, actually, the way we're going to kind of fix this problem is, you know, I got, I got some cash in my wallet here, right? And if anybody takes this from me, they're going to get the cash that's in this wallet. And at some point, it's going to be, if anybody gets my phone, yeah, you know what? They can probably get the money that that phone has access to. It's probably, that's the way it is, 200 bucks. Maybe it's 0.2 bitcoins, whatever it is. And we just need to partition our funds so that you know, you've got your savings, which is separate, and you apply a different set of security principles to that than you would with you know, what you're carrying on, on you with cash. And so spending limits and these types of things come into play here. Uh, policies about how money transfers from your main savings to, 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 to your cash and, and liquid accounts. That's how we'll solve it. And then one more thing to note is if you do lose your wallet, if, you're, if it's a single key system, which you know, some wallets are built on, and they keep all their keys on the phone, well then somebody can get the keys off the phone and spend those transactions. If it's using multi-sig with a second service, you could say, hey service, uh, I lost my phone, and then they can shut off signing. So there are other ways to solve that problem too. And then I guess my final question before opening it up to the audience would be just the general importance of open source in security. And um, I, I know at least most of you are, have worked in uh, open source protocols and building open source things. So what's, yeah, all of you have worked in this. So why, why is open source so important to, to security for cryptocurrencies and anything? Um. I don't think anyone in this room really kind of needs to be preached to. Um, you know, open source is how we audit this stuff, right? Open source is how we know and we verify that we're keeping honest. Um, it is the, the ultimate truth. I mean, there's bugs that we talk about with like, oh, what if you know, GitHub has something or you download a package you didn't audit or whatnot. But if you don't have open source, you, know, you don't even have the opportunity to talk. Um, you don't even have the opportunity to look and see if something is, is uh, as you expect it to be. So these algorithms are new. You know, we talked about some brand new uh, Threshold-based signature systems. You know these things aren't aren't fully proven yet. We actually need lots of people looking at this stuff. Uh, bugs in major software components. Open SSL. I mean that thing's been open open source for for what 20 years. I mean these these things need a lot of peer review. So anyway, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to find anyone on this panel that's going to say open source is bad. Uh, <laughs> open source is is critical. But to that point, just because something is open source doesn't mean it's secure. Uh, OpenSSL is the perfect example of that, right? And so, um, yeah, you know, I don't really know what the right answer is, but I don't think open, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you didn't open source your code, uh, therefore it must be insecure. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that the corollary is also true. Yeah, the uh, uh, a counter example to that is, is a bug that I was involved with several years ago. It was a Microsoft security bug. It had to do with an animated GIF, and, you know, there's buffer overrun, right? And so that gets found, and Microsoft patches it. Two years later, same bug shows up. Why? Well, it was closed source, and you know you just had to kind of scroll down a couple of pages in the source code. The same bug existed in two places. It took the hackers a little while to figure it out, but it's still there. I think open source would have found that a lot faster. Anyway, Micah's point is absolutely correct, that you know, open source does not mean secure by any means. Uh, open source is some of the buggiest, crappiest software out there. But at least if it's open, you can audit it. Yeah, I mean, it, uh I guess I'd say maybe the slightly more interesting question is where don't we have open source and where is it really hard to have open source? And I think, uh, I mean, a couple of people mentioned hardware being really big and that's uh, HSMs and, hard and open source are basically like opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. There is nothing like an open source HSM that I know about. Uh, TPMs on, on phones that basically the equivalent of a, a micro secure uh, chip on your phone uh, also, not super friendly to open source. The you know the microcode on those is definitely not open. Um, so, to the extent that we want to depend on hardware, uh, hardware and open source have you know that's much more of a work in progress than software and open sources. I'll address it. Um, 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if I had my way, I would try to open source everything that we do. Then you also have competitive advantage problems and other things, right? So there are reasons why you wouldn't want to do that, um, especially on the hardware side, like you're saying, because it's actually very non-trivial stuff to do this stuff. Um, the the thing about the hardware uh, security modules is at least there is uh, some level of a standard that these these companies follow. So. There's a FIPS standard, um, which is used to certify hardware for uh, the use in storing uh, top secret documents. I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but it's used uh, for, by the government, the military, as a way to sort of evaluate hardware against each other to make sure that they can store secrets safely. Um, there is some vetting that goes on there, and there's different levels of that standard. So, for instance, at a FIPS level 3 standard, what that basically means is if, if I have physical access to the, the device itself, I'm an attacker and I go to a data center and I want to break it open and steal the secrets, that the device would actually self-destruct. Um, and it's got environmental sensors and it's got, you know, like uh, tamper-proof epoxies on it and all other types of stuff. So, you know, it's, I would say that writing an entire, uh, writing an entire technology off because it's closed source would probably be uh, a fool's errand. That said, uh, code review is really important even in those things. Having external third parties that weren't involved in writing code is essential for any kind of enterprise software application and for especially for things you're going to sell to the government. And so it, code review, it, it's necessary but not sufficient for security. Open source is a great way to demonstrate confidence in your code and to say anybody can come review it, not just the people I'm paying to do so. Um, but frankly, um, the lack of open source microcode for hardware is something that keeps me up at night. And if people really want to work on you know, an exciting startup that I think Orange would be very interested in, that I know I would be very interested in, that I know Facebook would be very interested in, uh, start an open hardware company that does secure elements and secure, and secure hardware elements. That'd be fantastic. This comes back to how cryptography works in the first place. The good cryptography doesn't depend on not knowing how it works. It depends on not knowing the key. So uh, Julius Caesar, when he encrypted his messages, he just added 13 to the number, right? So if he took A, it would you know, become, uh, what, what is it, like G or something, right? He would just rotate 13 spaces, and that was his crypto. Well, as soon as you know how that works, you can decrypt all of his stuff. So that's not a very good system. The new crypto systems that we come up with now even if you know exactly how it works, you go on Wikipedia, you read everything about how elliptic curve cryptography works, you still can't break it because you need the key. The key becomes the security. So if you have a piece of software that's implementing a wallet or some sort of a Bitcoin security model, and you don't know how it works inside because it's a secret, because it's closed source, what you have is Julius Caesar easily breakable style cryptography, right? You don't actually have cryptography, you just have a black box. Open source takes it like and makes it like cryptography is supposed to be, where you see how it works and it's still secure because it's designed to be that way. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up quickly and say I'm definitely not saying that we shouldn't use hardware because it's not fully open source. I, I was uh, just trying to put the question out there. I think it's uh, it's an interesting challenge that we haven't we don't fully know what it means for hardware to be completely open, um, particularly in terms of how things are designed for tamper resistance. There's kind of like a lot of weird tradecraft there, um, and it's also not just hardware. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of different servers that you would use. It's not totally clear for what it means. I mean, uh, some service provider can tell you that they're running a certain version of source code, but that doesn't really give you all that you need to audit that it's actually secure and that they're keeping up to date with patches and everything else you'd like this server to be doing. Um, so, I mean, uh, I just wanted to put that out there as challenges that in the it's easy to say download uh, an open source wallet and use that on your computer, but all the other you know components of security that we've talked about tonight, we don't have as clear of a standard to get to for what it means to be uh, open and make sure that it's actually reviewed by people. And then of particular interest to Bitcoiners, I think, is we don't have the change list when RSA started adding particular bugs on behalf of whatever government you happen to not like. So I think open source has a particularly valuable role in terms of making sure that uh, you just know what's going in and it's not uh, some other inspiration. Okay, let's do questions from the audience. Um, yeah. So with respect to the importance of open source, would you say, um, Micah and Mike, that 
your companies and products implement full open source in all aspects of the code, especially sensitive code that touches and creates private keys even on the server side? We don't yet, but there's reasons for it that we'll get to eventually. I mean, I know it sounds bad, but uh, I think most software companies are this way. Yeah, I would say we leverage a lot of open source. Our, our cl all of our client libraries are open source, so anything that's touching somebody's device is open source or uh, anything that we distribute to other people to run. Um, there's a lot of our project that's open source, but uh, again, there, there are really good reasons for having a competitive advantage why you wouldn't want to do open source. And ultimately, uh, you know, if, if software was easy to protect, then it would be a lot easier to release it. So I, it's a trade-off that you have to make every time you make something. You know, do you want the whole world to run exactly your system and clone it? Not, not really. Not if I'm trying to run a business, but um, that's the trade-off you have to make. Just a, a point on that. So, I've uh, all of my companies have been enterprise companies. We don't open source everything. We we're active in our upstream communities. Is how we talk about our open source strategy. Um, I know for a fact that all of the software that touched keys at Trade Hill and at CryptoCorp and the software building touched keys at Domus, and I suspect strongly the software they built that touched keys at Gem and at Bitco are downstream of open source projects. Um, we were active in those communities. I bet these companies are too. It's good practice. So it doesn't have to be all open sourced for you to be benefiting from the peer review that's happening in the open source communities upstream of your product. And I guess I'd just quickly quickly add and say, I mean, like I said, uh, it's there's very various meanings of open source and what it means for a, a servers that a companies are running to be open source. But I think it was mentioned earlier that. Almost any company will have people involved in the process at some step, and it's not really clear what it means for your sysadmins to be open source. If you know every procedure that they follow to patch a server or to update is you know carefully documented and could be repeated by you at home, that's you're kind of getting to a you know an impossible standard. Even if you think every line of code that's ever run on the server you hope is available, um, it's basically impossible to know everything that a company is is doing. And I think it's it doesn't make sense to, you know, to say that you would demand that, right? Um, this is kind of just a, a comment uh, in reference to open source hardware. Uh, I wanted to mention that there actually is a company, a nonprofit called Low Risk, uh, L O W R I S C, one word, that is doing exactly that. Um, they are developing full stack open source hardware all the way to the processor. And I think that's a really awesome endeavor. And if you guys haven't heard of it, please check it out and support them. Yeah, um, yeah another comment, I mean, on the topic on secure uh, hardware and more like uh, open source hardware. I think if you want to play today with open HSMs, uh, you can play with a technology that is introduced in many ARM processors today called TrustZone, uh, which is quite interesting because it's very easy to check it. It's basically just two modes. Uh, when the processor runs in one mode, you have access to some resources. When it runs in another mode, you have access to other resources. And it can be used as a very simple building blocks to build more complex software like HSM and trusted execution environments. And today you have an open source project um, that you can test on, so which is called a USB Armory. And it offers a way to play with TrustZone on a very simple ARM core. So I would um, say that everyone interested to play with that should look up this project and start coding Bitcoin related stuff with it. And we definitely want to, to do it as a company. Yeah, I'll just make one more point on that. Like, um, we're we're leveraging uh, hardware that's built by a hardware manufacturer. We're not in the manufacturing of hardware business, so um, there's a large part of um, we're we're actually using systems that have been in deployment f by banks for 20 years. So there's actually some value to not necessarily using some scrappy startup 
hardware. And like, there is one other company in the space who has claimed to build uh, an HSM. And you know, I actually looked at. I would have. I would have gladly used it. But at the same time, do I really want to trust the future of my business with a, a startup company who's building something um, to hold all of the bitcoins? Uh, and so there is some value in in using, even if it is closed source, using. Um, somebody who's been there for the last 20 years doing this and has seen every attack in the banking sector at high volumes. Thanks for the great panel. Um, so in the news a little while ago, there was a report about um, some uh, group of hackers out there who compromised, may have compromised, uh, private keys of a company called uh, Jamalto. And uh, that's one of the uh, big manufacturers of these uh, you know, hardware security modules or trusted uh, execution environment, trust, Trustonics, Trustzone, that kind of thing. Um, if that report is true and uh, Jamalto had the you know, millions of their their private keys in this report were for SIM cards that went in cell phones but if this attack was launched on that aspect of their business it could have happened on the, the security hardware side too um, how do how do you think these kinds of like advanced persistent threats that these uh, hardware security module companies face uh, how, do, how do you think that factors into the security of these devices long term? Like, are they really secure? Is it is it security theater? Is it can there be a truly secure hardware? Um, but most importantly, you know, just how do you think that these kinds of threats um, will affect that uh, industry long term? Why is the mic coming to me? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think the answer is definitely no. You can never have a piece of hardware that you absolutely trust. Um, I mean, I think security is all about assurance at the end of the day. You have some mental probability of the uh, you know, percent chance that this component is going to hurt you. Um, so I mean, the solutions are you have, you should definitely not rely on one piece of hardware to have you know, the sole private key that protects all of your assets. That would be a mistake. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in the entire path to manufacturing a, you know, a secure, I mean, it's not just the risk of, you know, the company that actually makes the thing getting hacked, all of their suppliers, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's why we've been talking about multi-distributing trust across different, different hardware components, uh, different software components. Also, when you talk about advanced persistent threats, um, it's a very different conversation when you're talking about users versus enterprises. Uh, with users, GHCQ is not after you. The NSA is not after you. The Chinese might be after you, but I doubt it. Well, they went after millions of those big companies' customers by compromising all, like millions of private keys at once. I understand, so. but it's not going to be an individual sustained focus, which is what they would need to take your Bitcoin. Um, for enterprises, it's a bigger, it's a much bigger issue, uh, and it's something that you have to really think about who you're th scared of and who your threat things are, and work with professionals that can protect you from those people. So I think there's actually a big opportunity for Bitcoin to innovate in the non-Bitcoin space here, which is you know we've been using public key cryptography for a long time, it hasn't been working. Some people said, hey, you know, Bitcoin's going to help drive this thing forward. I mean, you know, I'm not sure the details of that breach, right? But somehow a key was compromised and they probably key derived it a zillion times. And that's probably the, the, the hack that occurred. What if it had been protected through something that was multi-sig? What if the other holder of the key was actually a different, a different company? What if the other holder of the key was in a different uh, jurisdiction? Um, can we make it so that we can have uh, all these traditional non-Bitcoin related uh, single key systems be multi-sig to protect and just the same way we're trying to do with Bitcoin. Like, uh, like, like we said earlier, Bitcoin is kind of the ultimate hack. You get it all. So we're having to deal with these issues. Um, we just haven't dealt with it in other industries as much. Yeah, so the, the keys that were compromised were basically just private keys that were used to encrypt conversations between, I think, the handset and the cell towers. 
Um, so I don't know if there's multi-sig for like encryption, um, but on that on that topic, are is is threshold signatures the same thing as a uh, like Shamir secret sharing, or is, are those different? Uh, they are different. Um, with secret sharing, I mean secret sharing was historically invented before threshold crypto. Uh, the difference is that with a secret sharing scheme, you have the same you know threshold of t out of n parties, but in that case they get together and reconstruct the private key, and then they all know it. Whereas with uh, threshold crypto, they can all agree to just sign this particular message, and that doesn't let them learn the key or sign other messages. So uh, threshold crypto is a strictly stronger primitive than uh, secret sharing. Um, but I, I would uh, follow up and say, I mean, there is kind of an interesting interplay between Bitcoin and other industries, like was mentioned. And I think in this case, actually, the the interesting thing is that the there's some pressure. I mean, people are demanding a little bit more out of uh, you know, hardware manufacturer because they're concerned about NSA hacks on communication, which is, you know, basically what, what's being discussed here if we want to put it out there a little more explicitly. Um, I think that, you know, we can probably all assume that that's been going on for much longer, like since before Bitcoin was invented. There have been, you know, uh, intelligence agencies that have been interesting in subverting the hardware manufacturer process for that purpose. Um, so, you know, maybe as more uh, more chips start getting manufactured to protect Bitcoin keys. Uh, we can learn something from what's gone right or gone wrong in, in you know, that process, which has been going on for a lot longer. And there's also, coming back to the original question that Paige had about 0.2 Bitcoin versus 20 Bitcoin, right? Uh, a lot of the things that we're discussing here tonight are actually cases where you'd be more interested in like sort of securing lots of money, right? Using hardware elements and things like that. Um, there hasn't been much discussion of how would you secure the small amount, right? I mean, th there's a lot of simple practical things that can be done that aren't hardware devices that can get a long way, right? A lot of simple, easy things like simply two-factor, right? How many people actually have two-factor turned on on some sort of a, a wallet, right? Little things like that that still also need to be done right. And then we can start talking about you know, now what do we do for the bigger and bigger amounts, right? We still need to get the basics right too. I had a question about um, how you guys view Coinbase, actually, because uh, this is an issue we struggle with a lot. Um, on the one hand, we have built the beginnings of our business on essentially storing people's keys for them. And I think that helped a lot of people get Bitcoin. Um, it also scares me a little bit, too, uh, sometimes. And I think, you know, like we came out with a multi-sig vault that lets people store their own keys. Um, when I compare it to some of the other solutions out there, I think about like all, what are all the ways you can get hacked, right? Like you could, um, you could somebody could fish you and you type in your password to that decrypts your keys in the browser and suddenly they've got it. Um, they could steal your phone, like you said. Um, and so in some ways, I think like you know we can probably do security professionally, um, or you can also just forget the password to your keys. I suppose There's another way. A lot, a lot of people have lost Bitcoin that way. Um, I guess I also think like when you when a big site gets taken down, like a lot of Bitcoin goes away all at once. But if an individual loses their own Bitcoin uh, bits and pieces, like it doesn't make a headline, but in aggregate, it might have been similar. Um, anyway, there's uh, I have a lot of conflict about it, but I guess I'll shut up and ask you guys what you think. Well, uh, congratulations on all the stuff you've done. It's been it's been great. Actually, I think uh, I think Coinbase has, has been remarkably good. So, um, congratulations on that. I, if there were one improvement I could I could suggest, it would be to make it so that everything is transparent and auditable. The blockchain offers us a lot of options here. And one problem we have when we aggregate funds into a single wallet is that you lose that transparency and that audibility and that proof of fund and proof of reserve, right? So um, that's one thing I guess I, I would I would point out. Coinbase uh, makes their money off of the exchange part of things, right? You know, the, the one percent transaction fee, dollar to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to dollar, the exchange itself. Um, storing the Bitcoin is actually a cost center. Like every, every dollar that goes into, or, or, or Bitcoin that goes into Coinbase now has to be insured. It has to be secured. There have to be, you know, lots of chains of command and making sure that these funds are actually taken care of by multiple people. Uh, I'm sure you, you're quite aware of the cost of that, and yet it doesn't make any money. So I think the long-term solution that the whole industry will move to out of just the simple economics of it is that users in some way, shape, or form are responsible for their own keys. And that 
The exchange will still exist, but that will be a service on top where the money that comes out of the exchange goes into the user's wallet and then the user is holding that money and then when they go back out it's going you know, through the service to the dollar or bank account. But that the actual storage of Bitcoin will be pushed out to the edges for, for that reason. So first of all, I want to say I have massive respect for what Coinbase has done for the industry. Um, I think most people, uh, you know, honestly, when, when a new person comes to Bitcoin and, and they ask me where should I get Bitcoin, I usually say Coinbase because honestly, I know they're going to have a good experience and I don't have to worry about them having some frustrating experience to get Bitcoin. So um, uh, I, I think uh, I, I would differ from your opinion in that um, I don't think that the, the keys necessarily need to be pushed out to the user and I feel like that's what you guys have been struggling with. And you don't necessarily, you, you know, um, and we've had talks about this too, like, I don't know that people really want to hold their keys. Um, we talk a lot about that in this industry, but the reality is when you talk to people, they're scared of holding their keys. And it's not just individuals, it's also businesses that we deal with. The businesses that are running Bitcoin services that are in the Bitcoin industry don't want to hold keys. So I don't think that that is the solution by giving them the keys, because it's not what they want. What I think what they do want is they want to, they want to know that their funds are safe and they want to be able to have control over their funds. And I think that we can, we can as a, uh, an industry, actually solve that by using multiple companies and multi-signature wallets to be able to give, you know, there are schemes that exist for this already. You know, the two of three that model that we do can be built in a way where you can have uh, both control and security over funds. And if we work together, we can build a solution that's way more robust than what the, the banking industry can provide. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'll second all that and say it. I think it's a, in response to maybe the first question of the night, I said, I don't personally believe in a future where every, every citizen is going to hold private keys to all of their funds. I think most people don't want that and will be, you know, perfectly willing to settle for somebody else, some company, uh, a corporation even, um, holding the private keys for them. You know, probably a lot of people in this room, like, don't personally want to do that, but, you know, if you... Uh, if we actually get to a future where most people hold Bitcoin and are transacting in Bitcoin in some sense, I don't think that they'll have the private key. Um, so, yeah, and like I said earlier, too, if I was giving advice to somebody on a relatively low amount, I would probably just say use Coinbase and don't uh, get on with your life. Um, don't, don't worry about downloading a bunch of software and, and setting up a bunch of stuff to protect the keys. But I, I did want to push back a little bit to what, what uh, was said about holding the keys being uh, a cost center for Coinbase and therefore something that should be, should be shed. I mean, you could make the same argument and say that having TV shows is a cost center for TV networks and they should switch to just showing ads because that's where they make the money. <laughs> um, you know, like the, the fact that Coinbase does provide a good service of holding keys for people uh, encourages a lot more business of the thing that actually makes them money. So I think to me it makes perfect sense that Coinbase and competitors will, you know, continue to offer this service to the extent that it, you know, brings people in to exchange money where they can actually, uh, actually profit. Um, so first of all, thank you for asking the question, and also I really appreciate all that you guys did for us at Tradel. That was really you guys helped make our business there while it was running. Um, I think Coinbase is doing an excellent job on key management, honestly. I think your your uh, your experiments here on multisig, on your vault service, on uh, API things, I think that are going pretty well, and you're learning a lot, and it's allowing you to enhance your core service. Where I would really put my focus isn't actually on key management. Where I would put my focus is on authentication and authorization. Um, where you've uh, tripped up before. Um, was mostly actually on like API tokens and uh, merchant integration and the places where you had perhaps less sophisticated users getting authentication tools that in the most services just happen for developers and how easy it is for that to get turned on on an account. Um, I think the real problem for you guys isn't making sure that um, the right keys are kept safe the right way. I think you've built probably more institutional expertise in that than anyone right now, save maybe Zappo. Um, I think the real challenge for you is how are you really sure that a user is who they say they are and not somebody who's compromised that person's credentials or even worse, that person's computer. 
And that's where I would really focus my research, are ways that you can interact with more than one of somebody's devices and other ways to really focus on the identity model. Cool. So with that, I think we'll end it. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining. And thanks for the questions. Um,